very much, Bob. Thank you. Welcome everyone to my talk this morning and thank you for choosing to come to my talk given that we have so many outstanding presentations on at the same time. First of all, I'd like you to put your hands together for some applause for our fantastic volunteers, Rob, Babak and Michael. So I've been involved in running Software Freedom Day, bar camps and for the first time this year, Linux Conference Australia, along with Dale Dickens, Donna Benjamin, Andy Galmay, George Patterson, um, Ben Sternfels and many others, I helped to run the 2010 Software Freedom Day in Melbourne. It was one of 300 similar events across the world. It was also judged one of the top three best events in the world and we won a fantastic MakerBot. This is the one that will be auctioned off at the Penguin Dinner. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was diagnosed with cancer just weeks after Software Freedom Day. But I really, really wanted to run a bar camp. So a few months later, with the help of an awesome team, including the fabulous David Bell, the, bar, the first bar camp Geelong was held. So, how many people in the audience are thinking of running an event or uh, would like to run a bigger event than you're used to? Excellent. Um, and how many people are here for the free Trevor Chops? <laughs> That's perfectly okay too. Well, after this session, you'll have the skills, techniques and resources to run an event as small as a user group meeting or as large as Linux Conference Australia. Helps if I turn my presenter on. So what are we going to cover today? First of all, there's a wiki that goes with my talk. When we did the run through this morning, we found that the QR codes on the slides weren't particularly good if you're a few rows back. So I'll give you a few seconds or so. Um, this is the wiki where a lot of the information I'll be talking about is stored. Um, so if you want to click through to that on your mobile device, I'll give you about 10 seconds. I noticed everyone's starting to time me. <laughs> So it again. Okay, time's up. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so, what are we going to cover today? We'll look at setting the vision for your event and we'll talk about how to measure its success. We'll talk a little bit about the financials and the funding side of things. We'll look at building your team and <laughs> dealing with difficult personalities. And we'll cover some tips to ensure you get some great quality speakers, find a great venue, and do some continuous improvement planning so that you want to run your event again. Do I have any hearing impaired people in the audience? Okay. Um, if there are, I have a full transcript available um, just in case you have any hearing difficulties. I'll just leave Rob with that for now. Uh, if you're visually impaired, um, and I'm talking and it doesn't describe the slide, please yell out and um, I'll describe it in a little bit more depth. So some fabulous photos there from Software Freedom Day and from Bar Camp Geelong. <laughs> With another maker boat. So the first thing you want to do when you're planning your event is to get a handle on how big your event is. Here you'll need to think about how much time you have to devote to the event, how much funding you're likely to be able to attract, how many people you'll need to help you and what skills they'll need to have, as well as the amount of planning and marketing that will be involved. Here it's great to have a ballpark feel for just how much is involved with uh, events of different types. <laughs> the situation you don't want to be in is where you think you're planning a small event and it turns into a massive undertaking. It's just a little Linux conference. <laughs> One of the things you might want to think about um, here is starting off small. Rather than jumping in at the deep end and putting in a bid for LCA, you might want to start off by running a local user group or running a bar camp. Once you've done these sorts of things a couple of times, it makes it a lot easier to go on to something bigger and generally better. So, once you have an idea of how big your event is, it's a good idea to have some form of vision or mission statement. Don't groan and moan, I'm not going to go into sort of Tony Robbins mode, it's okay. What exactly though are you trying to achieve with your event? Are you bringing a community together to build some social capital? Perhaps you're trying to raise awareness of a particular issue. 
or you might want to bring practitioners and developers together around a particular technology, as Donna Benjamin did so well over the weekend with Drupal Down Under. There's also another advantage to having an event vision. It's something that you can use to attract passionate and dedicated volunteers. So it helps to have something aspirational and inspiring that can resonate with people. Something like, we're going to run the best LCA ever in Ballarat, yes! Oh, come on. <laughs> it, it works a little bit better than, you know, uh, meh, LCA, yeah, whatever. Again, we've got some examples um, to help you out on the Linux Australia Wiki. Here's some we prepared earlier. Just follow the QR code. So, show me the money. Now that you have an idea of how big your event will be and what exactly it is you're trying to achieve. Awesome. Next, we need to think about how much it's going to cost. This is where fairy dust and magic sprinkles would be really nice, but unfortunately we live in the real world. Real events take real money to produce. There's a lot to think about when you're budgeting for an event. How much will venue hire? Excuse me. How much will venue hire cost? Will audiovisual equipment set you back a bit? Will there be additional charges for network access and wireless access? Then there's things like food and beverages to consider. For example, Barcamp Geelong took around $1,700 to run, all completely cost transparent. It's in the post-event report. Around half of that was food and beverage costs. If you're bringing a guest or a keynote speaker in for the event, you'll also need to budget for things like token gifts for the speakers. Um, and you can see here that the costs are starting to rapidly rise. Cha-ching! So, if you don't have a, a budget uh, for your event or you're wanting to start on an event and you're not sure where to go, of course, here's one we prepared earlier on the Linux Australia Wiki. So, once you have a rough idea of how much your event will cost, it's time to figure out where to get some funding from. There's a range of different funding sources and you'll need to figure out which one's right for you. At the lower end of the scale, such as for user groups, you might be able to get away with in-kind support. You might know someone who knows someone who can lend you a meeting room with a projector. You, know, you might know someone who can bring up a small website for you, that sort of thing. If you're thinking bigger, however, you're going to need some significant funding and there's a few avenues to try. At the federal and state government level, there are organisations uh, with different grant programs. For example, Multimedia Victoria has in the past been a very firm supporter of Software Freedom Day in Melbourne. And we've taken care to help build that relationship and, and keep it strong. Again, it helps to have contacts in the excuse me, helps to have contacts in the government rather than just cold calling. It also helps to have a good understanding of the strategic objectives of the organisation you're seeking funding from. So how, do you, how will your event help the government department or body meet its aims? You know, how do you find a win-win situation? In order to get funding, most government departments will require that you fill out some form of grant application. When filling this out, the best way to try and do it is to imagine that you're a government minister whose decision to find your event is coming under harsh questioning from the opposition. Would your application stand up to scrutiny? Is it well written? Does it show your event aligns with the department's objectives? This is particularly important if it's the first time that you're seeking funding. You really want to make a good first impression. First impressions are very hard to change. At the local council level, some cities and municipalities have major event programs which you may be able to tap into. Councils generally have aims of attracting a lot of people to an area to increase flow through business and that sort of thing. However, just a caveat, many local councils specifically exclude events which are not open to the general public, such as conferences which you have to buy tickets for. So again, it pays to do your homework. However, if you're running a large event, commercial sponsorship is probably going to be a necessity. Most commercial sponsorships will generally require some form of sponsorship agreement, which, if it's in the form of contract, is legally binding. So it's a good idea to be aware of any restrictions or requirements it might impose on you. 
Some of the items that are generally included in sponsorship ag agreements include things like use of the sponsor's logo and exactly what the sponsor will and won't cover. Items that the sponsor expects in return, expectations such as brand exposure, uh, free tickets and so on. One of the things that sponsors can get a bit narky about <laughs> is competitors. For example, I once organised a technical event, excuse me, oriented around video conferencing uh, with Arnet. One of the sponsors refused <laughs> to let one of the other speakers present, who, although they're considered a technical expert in their field, is technically a competitor to the sponsor. So you need to be careful how much power you give to sponsors, um, and that's uh, a lesson I learnt the hard way. Generally though, commercial sponsors are very, very good to work with. And again, it helps to have an understanding of what they're trying to achieve. Again, how do you try and uh, come to a win-win situation? So, now that you've got an idea of your scope, your budget and funding sources, you need to find a venue. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. At the smaller end of the scale, some universities tend to offer room hire, if not for free, then for a reasonable rate. They're also good because they generally tend to have audio-visual equipment already installed for teaching purposes. At the higher end of the scale, you're more likely to have to hire a venue. Again, some places which are public or public-facing, such as libraries, that sort of thing, may be willing to provide a discount, particularly if you're a not-for-profit organisation, or support your event in kind. You know, look, we, we can't give you, you know, all of the venue for free, but if we give you two rooms, we could give you these two other rooms for free. Generally, though, if you're running a large event, venue hire will be one of your major expenses. When you're selecting a venue, there's some key things to keep in mind. What spaces does the venue have available? How many people do their spaces comfortably hold? Often a venue will tell you that they can hold 100 people. What they neglect to tell you is that the 100 people they hold are very thin, very short people. Standing up. They're all standing. <laughs> yes, and packed together quite closely. So, you know, check it out, get some eyeballs on the venue, you'll feel a lot more comfortable. You also need to think about whether there'll be space for a registration desk food, drinks, and one of the lessons we learned at Bar Camp Geelong was that um, people are much more comfortable if they have some sort of secure storage area. We technical people, and we like to bring our technical gadgets with us, and we like to make sure that they're secure. You should also aim to have a mix of both presentation and breakout spaces. One of the value aids with most events is the hallway track, where you know you get to chat with people. <laughs> you can't have a hallway track if you don't have a hallway. <laughs> Another thing you'd like, you need to think about is whether you'll have the venue to yourself or will you be sharing? And if you're sharing, who will you be sharing with? For instance, it would be rather interesting if Linux Conference Australia was run at the same venue at the same time as TechEd. Hmm. No, no, I'll be good. You'll also need to think about whether the venue is easily accessible via public transport and whether car parking is available. One of the key challenges we had putting LCA in Ballarat was managing transport. Um, I, I think we've done reasonably well um, on that front. If people are going to drive, it's generally good sustainability practice to encourage attendees to adopt public transport options or sharing rides, that sort of thing. And if the event's over multiple days, you'll need to think about what accommodation's close by and some of the financial implications of that accommodation. Sorry, this is where I need my third arm. In my experience, there's been a couple of gotchas with venues and hidden charges. Sometimes the venue will require that you need to hire security guards, for instance, for the event, or they might require uh, you as part of the contract to use the venue's caterers. And the venue's caterers, for some inexplicable reason, always charge a lot more than other competitive caterers. The lesson, of course, here is to know what questions to ask when dealing with the venue so that these costs are not a surprise. <laughs> and, of course, if you'd like a checklist of what to check when you're looking at a venue, here's one we prepared earlier. Just follow the QR code. So, now that you have a venue all sorted, you need to give some consideration to audio-visual. 
As you can see on my left here, doing high-end audiovisual is no mean feat. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of organisation and it's often where events trip up. Depending on the size of the venue, you'll need to give consideration to issues such as the data projector, the resolution of the data projector, will it do 4x3, 16x9, will it only do 800 by 600? I think we were caught a couple of times yesterday in the mini conferences with different resolutions and outputting from laptops, that sort of thing. Of course, audiovisual difficulties can also cause significant disruption to the event. If you don't make a smooth start, people get bored, they get angry, and if you don't have chubba chups to bribe them with, they might walk out of your event. You also need to have contingency plans for when things go wrong. Notice that I said when and not if. Things will go wrong, trust me on this point. So you need to have some contingency plans in place. For instance, we've got spare data projectors in case anything fails, that type of thing. On the networking side of things, you'll have to investigate whether the venue has wired networking, where the network outlets are, and whether you'll have to run cables, and <laughs> how much gaffer tape you'll need. Most event attendees these days expect some form of wireless. Who'd be happy here if we didn't have wireless? Okay, I'll take you two out the back and beat you up later. <laughs> joking, joking. I think I just broke the Linux Australia Code of Conduct. That was a joke. <laughs> I'm just waiting for somebody to rip me off stage. <laughs> oh, you mean fire truck? This means you'll have to think about how wireless is going to be provisioned, particularly the capacity and bandwidth <laughs> and coverage. I know we've got a dead spot over here somewhere. It's not unusual for people to have three or four or 173 personal wireless devices each, so you'll need to make sure that you have enough DHCP leases to go around. One of the areas where we tripped up, if anyone remembers Bar Camp Melbourne at Urban Camp in 2009, <laughs> we managed to max out the, um, ba the um, bandwidth that they had available for their internet connection, I think, within about the first three hours of being on the venue. Oops. <laughs> exactly. If people are relying on 3G access at the venue, it's also a good idea to check the coverage of the major networks. And props to the person who put the 3G page up on the Linux Conf um, wiki as well. Very much appreciated. What was that question? You'd like a checklist so that you can check all of this stuff? I'm so glad you asked. Here's one we prepared earlier. Just follow the QR code. Cheesy grin. See, it's got cheesy grin written. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so as part of running the event, you'll need to build the right team. Here, you'll need to identify the mix of skills that you need for your team. <laughs> More importantly, you'll need to build a team with the right mix of personalities, which can often be more of a challenge. We've all seen some of the more extreme personalities that exist in our community, such as the detail-oriented nitpicker, the person who's so surly you don't want to let them congregate with other people of humankind, and the bossy boots who orders everyone around. What? <laughs> it will be your job to herd them all in the same general direction, harness their unique talents by assigning them the right kinds of tasks and produce a successful event. Fear not. There's a range of tools to help you with this on the wiki, here's one we prepared earlier, such as the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the Belvin team profiles and so forth. Yes, prepared earlier, follow QR code for list. One of the tough questions you'll have to ask yourself is whether you're the right team leader for the event. It's a very, very important question to ask. Often there might be someone else who is a better team leader for the event than you. And it takes someone very mature and very self-assured to be able to ask that question and answer it with no. But it's very important that you ask the question. So where do you get your awesome team? Hello, I'd like to order one awesome event team, please. Sure, please hold, just one moment. You probably already know or know of the people who will be best for your team. You've probably already seen them in action. You've probably seen them at a previous event and thought, geez, isn't Steve an awesome network engineering gun? You know, how do I get him on my event? The guy doesn't sleep for 40 hours straight. You know, I go to bed one night, I wake up and there's wireless. I want that man on my team. You know, 
you get the drift. Similarly, you've probably also come across the types of people you would prefer worked with other events. <laughs> Those that are lazy or require significant amounts of direction, constant prodding, <laughs> or those that overpromise and underdeliver. Often observing people in action is a really good way to see whether they'll be a good fit for your team. So, in order to figure out how many people on your team are really, really committed, there's a really good structure to use. Classify people as to whether they're fanatics, people who are passionate, engaged, energetic and enthusiastic. I'm going to do all the things. Give me all the organisation things to do now. I will do them all and I will do them well. This guy kind of strikes me as a bit of a fanatic. A uh, bit of a shame he's supporting the wrong football team. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Completely agree. Go Newcastle. So, <laughs> Geordie, the guy in the slide, yep, bit of a fanatic. The thing you need to watch out for fanatics is they can burn out. So if you've got a fanatic and you want to keep your fanatic, you want to keep your fanatic because they will do all the things for you. Just make sure they don't burn out. You know, feed them chocolate, feed them coffee, keep them on side. Allies are supporters whose time might be limited. They might not be fanatic, they might not be able to do all the things for you, but they might have some specialist skills, specialist knowledge, specialist contacts that you can tap into. Lukewarm people are, you know, oh yeah, a bit meh, whatever, yeah, I'll tag along. They're somewhat interested, but they might be unreliable or lack a bit of energy. Try not to give the important jobs to the lukewarm people. I'm not gonna make any tonton jokes, it's okay. People who are press ganged are those who are generally there against their will. They've been forced or they don't want to go, um, really go to your event. Sometimes it might be better not to have these sorts of people on your team. They can be more of a hindrance than a help. Keep in mind too that if you're running a free and open source software event, your team is likely to be made up of volunteers. In our experience, we found that mixing team meetings with some sort of social event, um, you know, drinks or going out for lunch, tends to fulfil some of the social needs that volunteers have as well. So a bit of work, a bit of play. It helps to attract people to the organising team. So in terms of team development, it also helps if you find yourself a mentor. And now I'm going to embarrass a bunch of people. Someone who's walked in your shoes knows the tricks of the trade and who can guide you. In my experience, these awesome folk, Ben, Donna and Pia, have been absolutely outstanding and I would not be here today if it wasn't for these people and I'd like you to give them a round of applause. Well done. She's so going to get me back for that later. So, now you've got a venue, you've got some audio-visual facilities, and you rang up and you ordered your great team. Now, <laughs> you need something that people are going to want to show up for. Chubba Chups is one option, but you may also want some awesome speakers. One of the greatest challenges here will be finding, um, finding great speakers, and there's a couple of ways to go about doing this. Outreach via mailing group lists, social media and professional networks is one way but it relies on the speaker self-nominating. Often the community knows about great speakers they've seen previously, so also be sure you ask the community for suggestions and sort of hunt those speakers down, find all the speakers. If you're planning an event that will likely run over multiple iterations or multiple years, such as Software Freedom Day or Linux Conference, it can be quite helpful to curate a list of speakers. Um, Understanding who's up and coming, who's perhaps not at conference level yet, but with the mentoring and guidance could be at conference speaking level in a couple of years' time. Once you've got your speakers locked in, you need to look after them. Most speakers put an enormous amount of time and effort into presentations. I mean, you can all see the 30 seconds that I spent on this this morning. <laughs> and your event would not happen without them. Of course, <laughs> another key reason is so that they want to come back next year. Um, but it also helps you to protect the reputation of your event. Looking after speakers is just a whole lot of little things. So provide a dedicated person to deal with the speakers. Have a single point of contact. Understand any special, any special requirements the speaker might have. 
and provide a speaker information pack with lots of information about your event so that the speaker has time to absorb that information. What's that? You'd like a template for one? I'm so glad you asked. Here's one we prepared earlier. Sometimes you might have to make a call on whether having a particular speaker at your event is worth it. Again, the community can be a great source of information around whether a speaker is great value or sometimes whether they're more, that more of a handful to have at your event than they are able to deliver in terms of value. Luckily, we don't have anybody who fits into that category at LCA this year. Luckily as the speaker liaison, no I'm being honest, luckily as the speaker liaison for LCA, I've been incredibly impressed by the professionalism and the demeanour of all of our speakers and it's another indication of just how great our community is. So, aside from the great presentations, and keeping your attendees well fed and watered is a key consideration. Apart from very practical matters like having a red hot scorching day and no water so that they all dehydrate and you know, all the paperwork you know, is a bit of a nightmare, food and drink is also another mechanism for community building. How many people have swapped some code over a cappuccino? How many people have made a sandwich and you know, solved, a, solved a problem or gone out for lunch with someone and built a community? Food is a community thing. If you're running a community event, food is part of that. Seriously though, if your budget can stretch to it, providing some basic refreshments and food is guaranteed to leave your audience with a much better impression. When getting catering, one of the things you might wish to consider is approaching community service groups such as St Lawrence, that type of thing. Often these are groups that provide opportunities for people who wouldn't have um, as many employment opportunities elsewhere and they also do fantastic catering. For instance, Bar Camp Geelong was catered for, uh, catered for by a company called Diversitat in Geelong which provides employment opportunities for migrants. Not only that, it was the most competitive quote we received. So not only was it socially good, it was financially good as well. One of your key considerations will be people with special dietary requirements. In my experience, the free and open source community is around 25 to 30% vegetarian, vegan, gluten free or some other sort of specialist requirement. <laughs> you don't want to alienate 25 to 30% of your community by not catering for them. Sorry about the bad pun. So, You've found a great venue, you've got the AV and networking under control, you've got some awesome speakers and you've arranged some great food and drink. <laughs> Guess you'd better let people know it's on, hey? <laughs> I might be generalising here but as IT people communication is not always our forte. Unsurprisingly, marketing and promotion seems to be something that we tend to struggle with as a community. So, how can we get better at this? A lot of it comes down to planning. A marketing and promotion plan is really quite simple. It outlines which stakeholders should get which information, at what time and how, in what format. And of course, if you're looking for a template for a marketing and communication plan for your free and open source software event, here's one we prepared earlier, please just follow the wiki. So what sort of groups can you target with your marketing and promotion? For open source and Linux user groups, uh, sorry, for open source Linux user groups are, sorry, let me just reboot, switch off, switch on. For open source and Linux events, user groups are an obvious first choice. Yes, we've listed them for you on the Linux Australia Wiki. Universities and TAFEs are a natural choice. <laughs> Where do I get a list of universities and TAFEs from? Well, we started a list on the Wiki. It's not particularly complete, but hopefully over time it will be. You can also try and reach out to the media. Here, it's a good idea to have established relationships with journalists or other media people prior to the event. It's easy to fall into the trap of taking an adversarial stance with the media, but they have a job to do too. And again, it's easier to work with them if you understand their needs and what they're trying to achieve. Again, trying to reach a win-win situation. Like any profession, there are the good guys and the not so good guys. With media, it makes things a lot easier if you can produce a media pack or plentiful media releases. This makes their job in producing copy a lot easier. So, 
Once you've got a venue and some awesome speakers and you build an elite team of ninja warrior event organising superheroes, you've marketed your event like a boss, you've catered like a master chef and you've provisioned all the internets, you're going to want your attendees to actually register. There are a number of options to do this and in selecting amongst them there are some things you need to consider. The first is how much you'll charge for your event. This can be quite important because if you don't have much sponsorship, you might actually be left personally out of pocket if you, if you can't cover costs. On the other hand, you need to set your event at a price point that encourages people to register and getting that balance right can be very tricky. Even if you have significant sponsorship and can cover your costs without charging for admission, you may wish to have some mechanism to prevent people from signing up and then not showing up. Maker Fair Melbourne, I thought, did this very, very well on the weekend by having a limited number of tickets, uh, even though they were free, and once they were sold out, you, know, you had to go on a waiting list for the ticket. And uh, a very well done there to Andy Gelmay, John and George are in the front row, who I'm also going to embarrass. It wasn't me. Wasn't you? Well, it was to Paul. Paul was the, the main man there. Uh, well, very well done to Paul. The other consideration when choosing an event registration is what sort of payment gateway it supports. Particularly in this community, not everybody is comfortable with PayPal. The other thing you need to think about if you're using some sort of payment gateway is how much commission the payment gateway will take. We used a product called EventArc for Barcamp Geelong and they took $1.30 out of each $10 registration, so effectively 10% of each registration. Um, I made that call on the basis that the tools in the back end actually made event registration a lot easier for us. So as if there's some tricks and, sorry, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's some checks and balances and some trade-offs that you'll have to make a call on there with event registration. So once your event's been run and you've packed up, you've drunk lots of alcohol to calm down from the stress, you've taken a deep breath, it's time to debrief the event and tease out some of the threads that need to be considered for the post-event report and continuous improvement plan. There's some key benefits to having a continuous improvement plan. I know I'm sounding like a project manager. <laughs> Bear with me. If you're seeking funding or sponsorship for future iterations, it becomes a, a lot easier to secure funding if you have evidence of previous successful events. Yeah, Sarah, you want $5,000 to run your event. Why should I give you $5,000 to run your event? Well, as it so happens, here's a post-event report that I prepared earlier. Why don't you have a look at it? So it gives you some artefacts that help you then secure funding for future events. If you're running more iterations of an event, you're likely to forget the things that went right and the things that went wrong in between year one and year two. If you talk to me in January next year, I'll have forgotten about half the things that went wrong with LCA this year, which were quite minimal because we're so well organised. The other thing that a continuous improvement plan can help you with is not just to help you, but to help the rest of the community. For instance, if, I, if I'm thinking about planning an event in Ballarat or Geelong or Melbourne, it really helps me if somebody else has already run one there and is running to some issues I might need to think about in planning. So a post-event report isn't just for you, it's also an artefact and a resource for the community. So what sort of statistics and metrics should you include in your post-event report? It's a good idea to have some idea of attendee demographics because it helps you to market the event. And it also gives you some insight into um, who is interested in your event or to specifically target underrepresented demographics. I've got uh, two slides left. It's also useful to assess how well the venue met the needs of your event. Financial summary is also important so that you can secure more funding. And a final word here on the post-event report. I strongly suggest that if you're doing a post-event report, put lots of visuals and lots of graphics and charts in there. The people reading it don't want to read a lot of text, they want pictures, they want to see how awesome your event is. What's that? You'd like a post-event report template? I'm so glad you asked. Follow the QR code and here's one we prepared earlier. So in conclusion, how awesomely well-timed was that? 
In conclusion, we've covered a lot of ground today, but I'd like to leave you with a few key takeaways. Set your vision, find a venue with good AV and networking, find your awesome speakers, market the event, get people to register, feed them, and ensure you grab their feedback so you can do it all again next time. The best event in the world is only a few planning documents away. Life is short, make it count. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks for that, Cathy. We've got uh, you know, 10 minutes or so for, for questions. If anyone's got any questions. Just to clarify, uh, that's all up on the Linux Australia wiki. Uh, yep, the question yep. there was whether the um, that's all up on the Linux Australia wiki. Um, I'm so glad you followed the presentation. Um, the Most of the material that I've referred to is up on the Linux Australia wiki. I haven't had a chance to upload my presentation yet because it got finished at 2 o'clock this morning. Um, it will be available at some place. Follow me on Twitter and I'll tweet out when the presentation itself is up online. It will be released as CC BY, so if you'd like to reuse, repurpose, um, it won't have a non-commercial restriction on it. Reuse, repurpose, do good with it. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Ladies first. <laughs> oh, ladies first. Nice. That's sexist. I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Kathy, that's just, I, can I can we go back ten years? Can you do that then? Um, I would be so much better off. Yes, here's um, the time machine. I prepared. Earlier. Here's the time machine algorithm now. Um, burnout. Yes. What? How? When? Big problem in our community. It is. It's huge. Um, the question there for the benefit of recording and streaming was burnout. How do we manage it? Big issue for the community. I burnt out after Software Freedom Day, two thousand and ten. I had had enough, I'd worked myself to the bone and I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And then I got cancer, so you know, life was pretty nasty. The way that you deal with things like burnout is to pace yourself. Understand what your capacity is, <laughs> do some capacity planning on yourself and figure out how many events can you do. I wasn't heavily involved in Software Freedom Day 2011, which probably means that I've got more time and more juice in the tank to give to Software Freedom Day 2012. You've just got to pace yourself, have a chat to people who um, will understand your burnout. And the other thing to avoid burnout is to try and help bring other people in the community to, to take up some of that. One of the things that Donna's done so well is not just um, initiate things like Linux users um, beginners meets. She's also actively mentored people in the community to follow on with her good work. And again, that's another measure to, or another mechanism to prevent burnout. And there was a question in here. That was my question. <laughs> So quite a lot of the stuff that happens to hand over from these events from year to year is uh, invisible to us. How do, what sort of takes place behind the scenes between these, um, you know, the teams from last year and this year that yep. to make it sort of gel together? Yep. Um, so the question there for recording and streaming was how do handover processes work between events that have multiple, multiple years? The short answer is chaos and necromancy. Um, what it all comes down to though is good documentation and good relationships with previous event organisers. Document all the things. <laughs> um, do you if, mean like regular? Like, do, do you actually physically mean? Yes, absolutely. For the Linux Conf Australia, yep. Um, so the issue with Linux Conf Australia this year was that most of the organisers were spread between Ballarat, Melbourne and Geelong. So we had a weekly team meeting over Google Hangout which was almost as good as meeting in person. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, good, good question. Sorry, I missed the missed that one. Um, within Linux Conf Australia, there's a mechanism called LCA Ghosts. So people who've organised the conference previously come and chat to the people who are organising the conference now, and um, you know they're a shoulder to cry on as we're having a heart attack and a nervous breakdown, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the, that's done both through sort of documentation and planning documents, but also through human relationships and keeping those lines of communication open. Um, the, the technical and the human elements are both very important there. What it stands for is ghosts of conference past. Um, Some quick question, a load out for us. 
We've learned how to not burn out ourselves. How do you manage your team if they're pushing themselves and even though they may recognise it, they don't want to deal with it? Yep. Um, excellent question there. The question was, how do you prevent burnout in your team? How do you recognise it and how do you deal with it? I don't have an easy answer for you there. I think it comes down to experience with team leadership and experience with people management and understanding the personalities of the people in your team. Do you have somebody who's going to work themselves into the bone and then have a nervous breakdown? I, I'm probably in that category. And how do you then um, bring them back and say, look, Kathy, let's go for a walk. Let's calm down, you're doing too much. I'm going to delegate some other tasks off to other people and try and give them a choice of what they really want to work on um, and what they would like delegated out to other people. People are best at tasks they really enjoy doing. It comes down to experience and, and observing those signs. Excellent question. Um, Sorry, just, uh, just, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry uh, Rob. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, how, how do you balance, um, you were talking about sponsors before and you are talking about you know, a particular conference um, where there was um, competition that there. How do you actually bo balance sponsors and community? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the marrying those sponsorship needs but then also marrying the needs of the community which can sometimes be quite different. Yep. Excellent question. The question there was how do you balance the needs of sponsors and the needs of the community? At the end of the day, I think it comes down to values. Some of your sponsors will share the values, share the passion um, and share the, um, uh, share the vision that you have for the event. And I think sometimes as event organisers, what we have to do is make some really tough decisions about event sponsorship and say, look, I really don't think that your company or your organisation is a really good fit for our event. I, I don't want to cause controversy, but imagine if Microsoft offered to sponsor Linux Conference Australia. They have. It's happened. <laughs> Excellent decision. So um, the advice that I'd give there is it comes down to values, understand the organisation, understand what they're trying to do and see whether it's a good fit. It's just like whether a volunteer or somebody helping on your event is a really good fit for that event. Sometimes you have hard decisions to make to say no, it's not a good fit. George. Yeah, just, just oh, on sorry. <laughs> Just on that one, that you know, you know, one thing that t tends to come in a, in a lot of contracts is that, that they'll ask that they want to vet each and every sponsor that you take on board after them, uh, yes. which you know can become a totally unworkable if they're going to, you know, you know, it takes a week for them to come come back to you. Yeah. Try not to give sponsors too much power. The good ones will understand sort of their boundaries. I was just going to reiterate what you were saying about uh, people burning out or feeling that they're excessively used, having run a number of different teams, that when you have somebody who seems to be doing an awful lot, it makes your job easier, but sometimes you can end up ignoring what's happening for them as well. So the fact that somebody's doing a lot doesn't always mean it's good for them. That's very true. Am I allowed to comment on yes, the sponsor's rather than question? The sponsor's question is a really good one, and I think Part of what I've learned is about expectations and each event will has a slightly different approach and I think it, it's almost at an event policy level you have to kind of make a call. So for LCA it's actually really easy. Microsoft comes and offers you money, you say thanks but no thanks. Um, Drupal Down Under for it, however, where Microsoft have been an extraordinary support for Drupal and done some good things, then yeah, that's cool. But um, one of the things which I think it goes across all of the events is that sponsors don't get to dictate content and I think that goes back to your lesson. And if you say that up front, before they sign up, they can't argue with you. Very good point there, Donna. Um, I do have an apology to make. I had a number of photographic credits, which I didn't put up on screen. I apologise to all the people whose photos I used um, without acknowledging my apologies for that. Any other questions? No? Well? Sorry. Underprepared. Uh, can, can you all... Uh, Join me in thanking Cathy for a very, uh, very thank enlightening very talk. Thank you. And, uh, a thank you very much. And thank you for all your help as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll just set up for the next speaker. Uh, Ian, if you're in the room. Yep.